Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. The Chinook was immensely powerful. Uh, it, it's a beast of an aeroplane. Um, if you consider on the wheels without fuel or crew, it weighs about 11 and a half tons. Max takeoff weight was about 23 tons, and the max you could lift with an unslung load underneath was about 24 and a half tons. So it gives you about 13 tons of vertical thrust if you put it in those terms. Um, incredibly maneuverable for its size. Anybody that's seen the Chinook display will find it hard to argue that for its size it does stuff you think you shouldn't do. Um, the combination of power and the controllability of the aircraft, it's not a heavy aeroplane to fly, it's actually relatively lightweight to fly. Um, yeah, an example of performance figures, uh, most light aircraft, take off, you'll climb, you'll climb somewhere between 700 and 1,000 feet per minute. Something like a Spitfire or a Mustang, on take off, climb a height, it will climb at about 1,700 or 2,000 feet per minute. In the Chinook, at light weights, you could sit there in the hover, pull 100%, and the thing will climb vertically at over 4,000 feet per minute. That's impressive. Uh, absolutely brutal amount of power. In fact, you were limited to how high you could climb because there was a concern that if you had an engine failure, actually you'd slow the blades down so much you'd never get it back. So you were actually limited to how high you could, how fast you could climb the aeroplane. But the power was there. So I used to, I used to um, make an analogy to something like a Westfield 7. You know, a brutal amount of excess power and then unfortunately aerodynamics take over. And you know, the Chinook, you know, it's, it's a functional beauty. You wouldn't describe it as a sleek svelte aeroplane in the mode of a Spitfire. Um, it has the aerodynamics of a house brick with two rotor systems on top, which is effectively all it is. Um, and eventually you just, you know, at 140, 150 knots, the thing stops accelerating quite too quickly, but it will still happily accelerate beyond 160, which is what we redlined the aeroplane at, especially if you were lightweight, because you still have more power to, to play with. Um, so very maneuverable, very powerful, very forgiving. Um, as, a, as a, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of guys flying the Puma. The Puma at the time was, was quite unforgiving in terms of engine handling. The Chinook was completely carefree. You could pump those engines as much as you could without any real danger of drooping the, the, the NR, the rotor speed. It was a carefree aeroplane to fly. If you, if, when you were learning on it, lightweights, if you, if you mucked up a quick stop or you mucked up a wing over, at training weights in the UK, you always had loads of power. You just power yourself out of it if you made a mistake, mm -hmm. um, which is something that other helicopters didn't, you, didn't allow you to do. Now that's great, but it's also one of the Chinook's downfalls is that you get so blasé about flying it. You've got you know, wind, what is wind? Now most helicopters have to approach into wind. Chinook can land downwind 25, 30 knots, not a problem. Land crosswind, not a problem. I've landed downwind on an aircraft carrier, which is completely against all the regulations. The Navy couldn't say, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, well, I'll, wait, I'll sit here and wait 10 minutes while you turn this boat round, so I'll just land downwind. Um, interesting, landing in your own seat salt spray, but it, the aeroplane can do things that you just, you can take liberties with it. You then take it to somewhere like uh, Iraq in the height of summer, you take it to Afghanistan, where it's high, it's hot, you've got high density altitudes. You have to then remember you cannot flow the aeroplane around like you do in the UK because you know it's mortal you know i've flown a chinook to nearly 20,000 feet to do an oxygen trial it, it's happy up there i wasn't happy up there felt very slow to be up that height um but um the the, the you have to just have that healthy respect that the i used to categorize the chinook really as, as three airplanes up to about 15 16 tons do what you like with it because the thing has just got brutal power and you could hover hover on one engine um in the uk with three tons of fuel and two and a half tons of payload on one engine um, on, a, on a normal day, broadly. Um, it was a second aircraft between about 16 tonnes and 20 tonnes, treated a bit more respect. Once you started going over 21 tonne, 20, 21 tonnes, it was time to start thinking, yeah, I need to fly this aeroplane, think about wind, think about power margin, think about committed calls, all the stuff that 90% of the time in the Chinook, you never have to think about. Okay, um, crew-wise, I think 
one thing to say right at the start, the Chinook was a crew aeroplane. It was absolutely a crew aeroplane. Um, it wouldn't function without crewmen. It only functioned because of the crewmen. Um, the pilots, the navigators, we were there to deliver the crewmen to where they needed to be. Uh, the crewmen controlled the cabin, the crewmen controlled the underslung load, they controlled the troops. They helped us with the navigation when we were, when we were struggling in terms of nav and, and comms in the front of the aeroplane. They'd man the guns, they would do everything for us. So the crew, normally four people, pilot nav in the front, two pilots, and then two crewmen down the back, one at the front right door, one at the ramp. Um, if you were doing something that was very benign, like instrument flying, you really didn't want to put two crewmen through the torture of flying around the instrument pattern for two hours, so you just take one crewman. Um, so normally a crew of four, and, and absolutely a crew of four. Um, there was no, you know, I, every aircraft captain did differently. I had a definite no rank policy the moment we, we, we walked onto the, onto the ramp of the aircraft. It was nicknames or first names, and the whole point there was everybody got a vote. So the crewman could be the most junior sergeant in the squadron. If he turned around and said, Foo, I'm not happy with something, he didn't go. Makes sense. Um, it was, it was you know, those guys made the aeroplane work. We just delivered them to where they needed to have their effect. In terms of number of people in the back, I think the most I carried was about 70 odd paras into, into Kosovo in the summer of 99. I think the Americans hold the record, or maybe we hold it now with Iraqi POWs, but you can certainly get over 120 odd people into the back of the aeroplane. Um, if you just take all the seats out, and what you do is you put, you basically put um, string ropes down the inside of the cabin and it becomes like the inside of an underground train. Everybody shuffles on, holds on. The Mark II, the Mark III that I spent most of my time flying, I'm passing acquaintance with the Mark IV. Mark II and III um, was a classic 70s, 80s steam driven cockpit. It's uh, smaller than you might think it is. Um, the aircraft really is a box that they needed to fly. So the, the designer said, right, we need to move this much cargo volume from A to B. Right, so I'm gonna box that big. Right, oh yeah, now we need to put some engines, undercarriage, fuel, rotor systems, and a cockpit on. So the cockpit of the Chinook is almost like an afterthought. It's substantially smaller than you think it is. Um, it's, uh, its visibility is pretty good. It detracts a bit when you start putting armor in, the, in the, some of the windows to protect yourself. Um, the seats are armoured, seats are actually, you know, I spent eight, eight, nine hours at a time strapped into that aeroplane sometimes. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I haven't got neck or back problems, and a lot of people have. Um, but the cockpit itself was, uh, it was intuitive. It was relatively high workload. Nothing was really joined up. It was all federated systems inside the cockpit, which is good in some terms, because it means you could just rip something out, put something in. Um, but also meant that you were doing a lot of times, you were looking around the cockpit, looking for what, bit of instrumentation you were going to, to, to tune or to move or to use or select. Unlike a modern system like the Mark IV with its lovely multifunction displays in front of you where it's a lot more information is in front of you. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I do believe that multifunction displays are a two-edged sword. With so much information, it's very, very tempting to just look at them the whole time. So because there was nothing that interesting to look at inside the Chinook cockpit at the time, the old steam driven ones, you were heads out a lot more, I would suggest.